It's early morning fog rising from the ground. We drove into this training area. The fog is sort of rising up a little bit more. And I see that we're in the middle of a bivouac uh, site from the Soviets. There was probably 60, 70 small pup tents all over. And so you can imagine, what do you do now? This is Cold War Conversations. If you're new here, you've come to the right place to listen to first-hand Cold War history accounts. Do make sure you follow us in your podcast app so that you don't miss out on future episodes. We return to the second part of Tom Favia's story with the US military liaison mission, which the Soviet Union permitted to operate in East Germany, ostensibly for the purposes of monitoring and furthering better relationships between the Soviet and Western occupation forces. As you'd expect, there are some incredible incidents that Tom shares with us, including one with a drunk Soviet major who tries to defect. Tom was with the US MLM when the wall opened in November 1989, and he describes the uncertainty of the time, with Soviet soldiers selling parts of tanks and munitions. If you've listened this far, I know that you are enjoying the podcast, so I'm asking for donations to support my work and enable me to continue producing the podcast. If you become a monthly supporter, you will get the sought-after Cold War Conversations drinks coaster as a thank you and bask in the warm glow of knowing that you are helping to preserve Cold War history. Still not sure? Here's Andrew Hawes, one of our monthly supporters. Hi, I'm Andrew, and I'm very proud to support Cold War Conversations with a small donation each month because Ian's put together such a brilliant range of interviews. If you want high power, there's the son of Nikita Khrushchev, the cross-border romances, old-fashioned spy stories, and the bizarre world of East European football. If you do support the podcast, your wallet will be a tiny bit lighter, but your brain will be very, very thankful. Just go to coldwarconversations.com slash donate. If a financial contribution is not your cup of tea, then you can still help us by leaving written reviews wherever you listen to us, as well as sharing us on social media. It really helps us get new guests on the show. So, back to today's episode, I'm delighted to welcome back Tom Favia to our Cold War conversation. I presume you had some incidents where the... Soviets were trying to block you in or the Stasi was trying to uh, hinder you. Can you describe any of those? Yeah, detentions. Uh, and, and again, that was one of the things that it, if they detain you, then take the detention. Don't, don't risk getting uh, injured uh, if they de- detain you and don't injure them either. Uh, so uh, if they try to block you in front and rear of the vehicle, then you would just uh, stop. And, and in those cases, uh, it was usually just a waiting game. Um, so they would uh, call the commandatura from the next uh, near village or, or city, and then he would come, and then he would, with the U.S. officer, they would be uh, discussing. He would be accusing us of being spies and being somewhere we were not supposed to be, and we would say, no, that's not true, and we're allowed to be here. And, and usually after about an hour, they would want us to sign uh, something and we'd say, no, we're not going to sign it. And then sometimes they would just say, okay, and then go. Or sometimes they would take us back to the commandatura and the officer would drink a vodka with them and then we'd go. Uh, so you know, sometimes it could get a little bit nasty, you know, if it was rammings. Uh, but in, uh, in my my time there, I only had one near, near incident. So maybe it was luck. Maybe it was just because I was good. <laughs> I'm not sure. But you never knew. That was the, the, the problem. You never knew how they're going to react. You could, we could drive into a training area. I'll give you an example. Drove into, it was early morning, fog uh, rising from the ground. We drove into this training area and the usual procedure, engine off, don't use the brakes, let the vehicle roll to a stop, roll down the window, look and listen. And as I'm doing that, the fog is sort of rising up a little bit more and I see that we're in the middle of uh, a a bivouac uh, site from the Soviets. There was probably 60, 70 small pup tents all over. And so you can imagine, what do you do now? 
So I think to myself, the officer was also just waiting for me to decide what to do. And I said, well, if I, if I panic and overreact, it's probably going to be worse. So I turned on the engine and just started driving through. A uh, couple of pup tents opened up, guys looking out, looking at us, and I'm some waving at them, and they wave back. And I drive straight through. Uh, so, you know, I was very lucky. But other times, you know, you would pull into a, into a uh, let's say they had these, every, every piece of wood or every wooded area in East Germany at the time was really a training area for the Soviets. We used to call it the, the playground for the Soviets. Because every forest, every wooded area you would drive into, there was some kind of Soviet uh prepared fighting positions and some were, you know, for scud missiles, some were just for infantry uh, vehicles or units and some had bunkers. And sometimes the bunkers were manned all year round. And sometimes they're only manned a couple of times a year. So you'd pull in and there'd be these two poor Soviet bastards, as I'd call them, that were left there. They didn't know how long they were going to be there. They didn't know when they were going to be picked up. Uh, they, they were left with a couple of cans of, of fish and, and, and a couple of cans of, of water, and that's it. Uh, and that's why there were always two of them, to make sure, you know, one didn't uh, try to, to run away. And they were happy to see us. They were happy to see us because then, you know, we'd give them some Coke and, and chocolate and some reading material, uh, and they would tell you everything. The unit, the unit commander's name, the, the company commander's wife's name, the kid's name. Uh, but if an officer showed up, then they would react very differently. Uh, then they would come out with, with AKs. Um, so you never knew how the Soviets were going to react. So you always had to be very, very cognizant and careful. You know, we were uh, driving along columns. They had their, their driver's training going on through East Germany every day. And there'd be columns of vehicles. So we're driving past and photographing and recording their numbers. And I'd always have to keep an eye and see what they're going to do. Because you never knew if one of these big Ural trucks were now going to just pop out and try and ram you. So that was always the issue with the Soviets. You really never knew how they're going to react. Um, when you asked earlier about the Stasi, the Stasi tried following us uh, once we crossed into uh, Potsdam, they were easy to, to, to pick to pick out. It was like a Blues Brother movie. You know, they, you know there'd be like a, a better made car with two or three guys or four guys with sunglasses. Uh, oh, I wonder who those guys could be, you know. <laughs> uh, and they would try to stay up with us, but they had no – we were technically superior because of the equipment we had. So the, the vehicle alone, we'd get on the, on the, on the highway in the East German Autobahn, in those days, the East German bomb, Autobahn didn't have any any barriers uh, on them. Uh, so they would be behind us, and then I would just say, okay, well, let's just drive off here, put in four-wheel drive, go through the woods, and that was it. Uh, so they, they really didn't have um, an edge over us uh, to really stay behind us the entire tour. There was no way. It was impossible. Uh, they would pop up every now and then. It was like we were, for them, also a target of opportunity. We knew that there was a special unit from the Stasi, that was responsible for the missions, uh, but they also had their their informants. So I think that was mostly the way that they tried to keep track of us, but through their whole network of informants, uh, uh, and inform that was probably easier for them than to, to try and stay behind us with a vehicle. And we didn't target, and we didn't target specifically East German units. The, the, the British mission did. The U.S. we did not specifically target uh, uh, East German units. For two reasons. One, uh, from a, let's say, political reason to, to sh basically show the East Germans that, look, you are not the enemy. Uh, the Soviets are our enemy. And two was because uh, the East Germans were simply more disciplined than the Soviets. Uh, they were, their military units were, were uh, more quicker to react against the missions um, because obviously they, it was their homeland. So, uh, you know, <laughs> they had more of an interest also to, to, to do that. And that's why a lot of the, the, the British uh, detentions were from East German uh, units as well. Did you have to 
stick to the traffic regulations of East Germany? Because I presume you were speeding and all sorts of... Well, it was basically, yes, we were, we were supposed to follow the uh, East German uh, regulations, uh, but obviously we could break them uh, for safety and tactical reasons, which was then most of the time. I mean, if we were just traveling from one target to another on the Autobahn, I would drive maybe 120, uh, not faster. Back then it was 100, it was allowed 100 kilometers an hour uh, in East Germany. But uh, I would, you know, probably do a cruising speed of 120. But if we were in a tactical uh, posture, then everything went. As long as obviously I wasn't endangering uh, anybody, uh, you know, I, I would, would hate to have, have endangered uh, stand, you know, bystanders, uh, but that's why we also had example, lots of East German marks with us. Uh, if we had a f- small fender bender with, with an East German, uh, we usually just gave them 10,000, you know, East German marks and they were happier than you can imagine. So, wow. <laughs> so yeah, I could imagine. <laughs> so, but that happened. That was re- very rarely that, that, uh, there was some small fender benders. Uh, again, I think it was just, uh, probably luck and good, good judgment, that played a role there as well. Did you go into any of the permanently restricted areas? Uh, personally, no. We drove through them. Uh, I know that in, in the past, if there was some really uh, something going on that they wanted you to look, we would say, okay. But uh, I know from, from information that, that the French um, were a little bit more keen on, on uh, disregarding the PRAs. Uh, but we, obviously, we had the right to drive through them. Uh, to transit through them. So that was no problem. We were on the Autobahn, uh, which was, uh, uh, you know, going through a PRA, we could use it. And if we stopped at a, you know, on a bridge because we had to take a break and maybe we could, you know, from that bridge, take some pictures. We did that. I know one time that I went through a PRA uh, purposely because uh, one of our officers, he was at a OP, he was out on tour and it was night. His wife was in West Berlin and she went into labor. So uh, the chief of mission said, look, we need to go try and find him because we have no communication. See if we can get him back before his wife uh, has the baby. Uh, and because I knew I'd been out with, with that officer quite a bit, I knew usually at night in that area where he would be at an OP on a, on a rail line. So we drove, uh, we broke every rule imaginable. We were in the sedan. So I was a Mercedes sedan. So I was driving, you know, through these villages where normally 50 kilometers an hour is probably driving, you know, 150 uh, and straight through PRAs. We did find him. He was very, very surprised when we pulled up. Uh, and then I brought him back. Unfortunately, the, the baby was already there before he got there, but we did our best. But that was the only time that I personally uh, broke the PRA uh, rule. But you you were detained at some points, were no, you? No, I was never detained. No. Again, I said I think hey. you were lucky uh, or good judgment, but I was was never detained. Yeah. Very impressed. Very impressed. Um, have you any idea what's the most important document or item that you and your officer found while on tour? Uh, there, there was actually quite a few. I remember because when when I left and I got my award, it was all written up. But you were really never that cognizant about, uh, you know, all these these intelligence uh, gathering, uh, let's say, issues. You just did it. Uh, and um, when you got back, you just debriefed and went on your next tour. Uh, so to, to now specifically, I know one of the things that was was uh, mentioned, in fact, was when we uh, followed through on a Russian um, a tank training exercise so we've actually been, been able to capture their uh, tank firing techniques uh, with the t64 Bravo uh, just just to name a few you know, some some other ones that were very similar uh, photographing new equipment that was come, came into theater 2s6 and we pulled into a, an area which was a, a air defense area a unit area and there was a 2s6 just uh, sitting there. The driver was in the driving department sleeping, no one else around. Uh, I, in fact, left some flowers on his uh, on his window. Uh, and we just went all over the vehicle, photographing up close and uh, everything. Um, so those were nice things that happened. And, and obviously, when they when we had the opportunity to do that, we, we took advantage of it. 
uh, and I still have that picture where you can see the driver in the uh, in the window sleeping with the flowers next to his window. <laughs> I'd love you to share that with me if if you're happy to. <laughs> yeah, I can do that. There's no problem. <laughs> and I'm I'm interested to know your your um, meetings with East German citizens. Were they generally friendly to you? The normal citizen, obviously, before the, the fall of the wall, they had to be very careful. And we knew that as well. We didn't want to place them in, in, uh, in harm's way with uh, or create problems for them with the Stasi. You know, we, we knew that one out of every 10 East German citizen was an informal uh, uh, member of the, of the Stasi. Uh, and I think uh, we found out later that probably even more after the, the, the fall of East Germany. So, you know, their network of, of spying on their own people was, was enormous. Um, and so we didn't want to create issues. But if we, if we had the opportunity, uh, we would, and we saw that they didn't have a problem with, we talked to them. Now, we also kept in mind that they could be working for the Stasi. Uh, but, you know, we accepted that fact. And it was because it was also part of, of the mission to show the East German uh, people that, you know, hey, we're the good guys, okay? Um, they had training uh, classes in school for kids. And I, I saw that on the East German TV about the missions and portraying us as, you know, evil. The kids shouldn't go up to us. If we give them anything to eat, don't take it because it's poisoned. And, you know, so all this kind of propaganda. Uh, but kids are kids. Uh, they didn't believe that. So, you know, they would come up to us and we'd give them Cokes and, and candy. And uh, so that was one of, you know, one of these, these also part of the mission to show the East German, uh, you know, people that, hey, we're the good guys. OK, we're only interested in the, in the Soviets and they hated the Soviets anyway. Right? It was nothing, nothing that you know, all that propaganda about the brotherly, you know, Warsaw Pact uh, socialist. Uh, they they did not like the Russians. And because the Russians were really, the Soviets were really an occupation army. Um, they did whatever they wanted to do uh, in East Germany. Uh, you had tank ranges going, or tank uh, trails going through villages. They they fired over houses, homes in, 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 in small towns, the tank range. You know, they training 24 hours a day. They flew aircraft over these, these small villages. They did whatever they wanted to do. Uh, and that's why the, the East Germans really didn't like the Soviets that much. To put it to put it uh, easily, did you did you stop in villages and buy food or anything like that? Yeah, or, if we had the opportunity, I mean, there wasn't much to buy, uh, but uh, if we had the opportunity and we saw that you know one of these uh, stores and maybe there was a couple of people waiting in line and and uh, we would stop in to get some you know something to drink that was usually nasty anyway, um, ice cream that tasted not like ice cream. Uh, uh, Everything was, it, to me, it was it was really amazing how, you know, that country, you had so many villages and, and, and cities that were still partly in ruin from World War II with with bullet holes in the walls and, and, and things like that. And then, uh, you know, it was just a, a bankrupt country. Um, you had these huge... Uh, let's say factories that, that uh, were 2000 people, everybody had a job in East Germany, uh, but they didn't produce anything. Okay. They all had a job. They didn't earn anything. They earned monopoly money, uh, but they all, all had a job. Uh, so it was that whole, that whole thing was just one big lie. You know, everything that they produced, if it was something that they produced, which was good of any quality was exported. Um, so, you know, I remember talking to an East German once that worked in a pickle factory, very famous Spreewald Gurken. Uh, and he worked there, I don't know how many years, uh, 20 years. He said, you know, and I never ate a pickle because it all gets, <laughs> gets sent to Bulgaria, to Hungary, to Poland, uh, to, to Soviet Union. Uh, so that was, you know, it was just a matter. I didn't, you know, it was a matter of time that that whole system fell apart. That it went so quickly amazed me, obviously, but I knew it was just a matter of time. I mean, were were people surprised to see an American in uniform in in their country, or or were they very familiar with the liaison you mission? My years, the last so the last years of the mission, uh, they were obviously very used to us uh, because you know we went through every small little village, uh, big city, you know, so. 
they knew about us, obviously. And uh, a lot of them were just curious. Many were still curious when we pulled up and, in, in the G-Wagon and, you know, for them, you know, because they drove in these, these plastic cars and most of them didn't have a car because they have to wait 20 years to get one. So, you know, when they saw this G-Wagon, you know, they were always very impressed. One of our mission uh, chiefs, I think was in the 70s, uh, had his own vehicle as uh, with his the mission plate on it. So he could do that. And it was a, a uh, sports wagon. Uh, I can't remember what, what some Corvette or something like that. So I remember having seen a picture of him, you know, somewhere in East Germany with that and everybody surround all these Germans looking at that, but that was his, his mission car, you know? So, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I was surprised, you, you know, you mentioned the fender benders yeah. and, and paying off that. I'd imagine if you hit any Trabant with a G wagon, there's not going to be much left. No, of the no. I, I, we assisted one time an accident on the Autobahn. Uh, where um, I, I don't know what he hit. In fact, I, I think it just fell apart. Uh, and, and, <laughs> and, you know, it was just parts of that vehicle everywhere. Luckily, they weren't badly hurt, but we rendered uh, uh, first aid uh, until the East German uh, authorities came. Uh, but the thing just fell apart. I think he was just going too fast, and, and it vibrated, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, well, the state of those roads, I can imagine yes, it, yes. it might it yes. might fall apart. Yes. Um, Tom, where were you when the wall opened? Well, I was in in uh, uh, the mission, so I was uh, there during the entire, let's say, everything that led up to it, and that was a very uh, strenuous time for us as well because we 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 didn't want to take you know part in any of it. We didn't want to even show that we were interested in all the activities that were going on the east german uh, protests you know we would sort of monitor from a distance uh but we tried to stay out of the way stay neutral uh so like i said that, that that everything happened so quickly really surprised us and on 9 november uh i was not on tour i was in west berlin but we were always on standby so if you had a pass you were on standby it doesn't matter if you were not on tour and when the uh, announcement came that the Berlin Wall was had opened, it was in the evening sometime, I think like 19-something hours or 18-something hours, we all got contacted. So there, there were two tours out on the, uh, in East Germany already, uh, and our mission chief wanted to send us all out uh, to monitor the situation because we, we didn't want to get involved in what was going on with the East Germans, but we wanted to see what what the reaction of the russians so that was our concern uh what what's going to happen what are the soviets going to do and so that was a pretty uh a tense uh um, few hours until i think it was around midnight it was close to midnight we finally got the facts from the soviet Exter uh, external relations branch and that was a a small unit of soviets that were responsible for coordinating with us in, in Potsdam. So that was our main point of contact in Potsdam. And they got the facts from uh, their commander-in-chief in Zussen Wunsdorf, uh, Marshal, I can't remember his name at the time. He ended up go getting arrested anyway uh, later in, in Soviet Union from uh, uh, for corruption. No big surprise. But <laughs> he had sent a fax. Well, surprise, <laughs> uh, the surprise is he got arrested for corruption yeah. because, you know, you... Yeah. Uh, but anyway, no, yeah. carry on. His Tom. facts, his facts, he sent the facts to, to all the uh, Soviet units stationed in East Germany that they uh, should remain in the concerns, in their uh, camps and uh, facilities and not get involved with the sovereign activities of the German Democratic Republic. And that's when we knew that it was over that it was the end of, of East Germany, because that was our concern is if, you know, the Soviets, are they going to put a stop to it like they did uh, in 50, whatever it was, uh, the uprising, 53. Yeah, the uprising yeah. or or not. Uh, so they said, nope, we're not going to get involved. Uh, and so we knew. Uh, and it was amazing because uh, I was out uh, in, uh, in East Germany and the next day, the 10th. Um, it was, it was as if someone hit a switch, a light switch. The next day, uh, Stasi were gone. The Eastern border troops were waving at us and smiling at us. They were, you know, the, the Vopos, the police were telling us where the Soviets were. 
people were coming up to us and hugging us, uh, old ladies, you know, telling us uh, uh, not to leave them now. And so it was like, it was just from one day to the next, everything had completely changed, which, which made it obviously very interesting, but it complicated some of the, some of the operational procedures. But I, I remember one thing on the 10th, which was also amazing is that the East Germans had told us that the Glinica bridge was not going to be open to the normal public. It was still going to remain closed. So the one side for the missions and the other side for the diplomatic corps. But sometime during the day, the pressure was just too much. Uh, and they had to then open up the East German side to the normal traffic. So we were trying to get back to, um, to West Berlin and we pulled up, in at the major intersection which would lead to the bridge in Potsdam and there was like four lanes of backed up trobbies and Barkbergs and whatever and we were like oh my god and out of this out of this four lane of of cars comes running towards us an East German border troop who the day before you know would have pointed his his AK at us and he's waving a baton smiling and he's telling us to, to follow him and he leads us through all this traffic to the bridge. In the meanwhile, East Germans are jumping up on top of us and kissing us through the window. And there were a news crews on the bridge. And so it was very exciting to us. You know, I was like, oh, gee, yeah, I mean, I'll get some kisses from some nice East German women. But the thing that really stays in my memory is we pull up to the bridge where the Soviet guy, uh, troop is, and the look on his face, he was so scared shitless to put it bluntly, he didn't because he, he had no idea what was going on. And, you know, this poor kid opens up the gate for, he was trembling, you know, lets us through, goes through the motions again of, you know, checking the, the, the ID cards and the vehicle, but he was just terrified, terrified. And that's the thing I remember about that day, the poor, the poor kid on the bridge. Yeah. I mean, the whole, their whole world had turned upside down. You know, both the Soviets and, and the East Germans. And like I said, what made it then more difficult for us is up to the German unification, uh, because we were still operational, the Soviets were still there, uh, but now the borders were open. So before the Autobahns were basically empty, you know, except for Trabant. So now you had all these West German cars coming through and traffic jams. And uh, so we also have to be careful about how you know west germans getting stupid and driving into a soviet training area or around an insulation and maybe getting shot so uh it was a it was a pretty uh sensitive time because also the, the soviets they knew everything was falling apart and now it was like everybody on their own especially the officers we had you know officers that were selling weapons munitions uh uh so that was also a very, very uh, dangerous uh, time. Uh, they were, you know, offering to sell you parts of tanks, and uh, so they, they, everybody wanted to make money now because they knew it was over, uh, and soon they were going to be going home. We picked up a drunk Soviet major on the autobahn in the middle of the night. And normally, we we shouldn't have done that because not in the vehicle, but somebody would have ran him over. Uh, we pulled him into the into the G wagon. And he was begging us to to take him to, uh, he wanted to defect. And we said, no, we, we can't take you. We work for your boss. <laughs> so, you know, And he was just telling us everything. He was drunk, very drunk. And then we drove him off the Autobahn, about five, six kilometers from the Autobahn, and let him out. Obviously, we never knew what happened to him. But uh, those are the kind of things that were, were happening then as everything was falling apart. Um, the, the Soviets were also embarrassed because... You know, now you have all these Western Germans driving through East Germany and their uh, concerns look terrible. Uh, some of them, you know, they hadn't done anything since the end of World War II. Uh, so now they were like painting the walls with gray paint on the outside so it looked a little bit um, nicer. Uh, those were the priorities uh, at, at the time. So it was it was a really, really strange um a strange situation leading up to German Unification Day. Yeah, because presumably there there were probably other intelligence organizations driving around East Germany trying to recruit some of these people. I would definitely think so. Yeah. 
You know, that's why I said, you know, when people people would call us, and that's one of the things I always tell people, they would say, and they refer to us, you know, spies. And I said, well, no. I said, we weren't spies. We were conducting reconnaissance. We were in uniform. We were in uniform, clearly marked. We were in vehicles that were clearly marked. Spies are the other guys who are running around in civilian clothes and, and doing that kind of stuff. So, no, I'm, I'm sure, you know, those those agencies were, were very active at that time. Did you ever bump into anything that you thought, hmm, this looks a bit suspicious? Uh, it was, like, there were so many things that were suspicious in East Germany. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it's hard to just say, you know, point, point out to something uh, specific, but there was, there was so many things. You know, like I, I mentioned earlier, all of our uh, house staff, we knew in the Potsdam house were, working for the uh, recruited by the Vopos Stasi. I remember a funny, a funny incident is um, one of the, uh, one of the folks passed away. So one of our officers, who is the uh, naval officer, he was a Marine, a Lieutenant Colonel, he decided to show up at the funeral uh, in Potsdam for this guy. So they were all standing there in their military uniforms <laughs> On this guy's casket was the East German flag with his with his with his uh, hat, his uniform hat, and they were all kind of a little bit, you know, embarrassed that uh, now here's the the Marine Lieutenant Colonel who showed up at the funeral. <laughs> yeah, no, I can I can imagine that being. Uh, ooh, we weren't expecting that. A little bit awkward. A little bit awkward. Yeah. So, what what were the days leading up to Unification Day like for you? We continued with uh, with our operations as as normal, and probably even a little bit more uh, extensive, except to keep an eye on those kind of activity, activities that were taking place. Uh, we had been given a lot of money, uh, dollars to, to 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 get that stuff off the street. If if in case we we noticed people were selling uh, grenades and, and weapons and things like that, uh, so that was an additional burden on us uh, to to keep an eye on those kind of things. But we were continuing with. Uh, with, with the, the normal activities. Uh, but on the other hand, you know, we knew that the talks were going on uh, and that uh, we would be um, deactivated because, you know, the two plus four agreement and uh, there would be no, no reason for us to exist any longer. The legitimacy would be taken away. So we knew the end was coming. Uh, and in fact, the missions had to deactivate one day before German unification because that meant we gave up that sovereignty or that we had uh, and gave it back to the uh, to the Germans. So one day before German unification day, we officially deactivated. Uh, we had one last uh, big tour through Potsdam. We all met on the bridge and then with all our vehicles uh, drove through through Potsdam one last time and also the Soviets on the bridge and they pulled down their flag and we, we drank. We had official ceremony at the mission house. Uh, all the missions did. Uh, and then uh, at the bridge with the Soviets, again, uh, they pulled down their flag and uh, there was more alcohol involved. And then that was the official end of the mission. But we continued, obviously, because we had a lot of things to, 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 to close out in Potsdam. So we, we, on the next day or the next, I think, two or three days later, the vehicles, we changed the plates to uh, the military via, um, um, uh, license plates uh, issued uh, to uh, a U.S. military station in Berlin. Uh, so we changed those plates. The emissions plates went away. Uh, and so we were driving back and forth. Uh, and then the unit evolved into a, a newer unit uh, because the Soviets, until the Soviets left in 94, I believe, they still want to keep track of the Soviets, but then it was done actually in civilian clothes and uh, in, in those vehicles with these uh, civilian plates, uh, trying to monitor uh, everything up until the, the, um, the departure of the Soviets from Eastern. But I was gone. I was then recruited a couple of months after the deactivation. I was then recruited with a lot of other people from the special operations uh, side of the house uh, to move on because of our qualifications. So I was recruited by the on-site inspection agency uh, to conduct arms control uh, treaty inspections. So uh, because of obviously our, our knowledge with equipment, 
uh, equipment identification. Uh, so I moved then from East Germany to Soviet Union. <laughs> so kept moving further east. Where were you working out of in the Soviet Union? No, well, we working we were working in uh, in West Germany uh, or in Germany in Frankfurt on the Rhein-Main Air Base. It was a former uh, U.S. Uh, military Air Force Air Base, and that's where we had a Ford unit because the on-site inspection agency is located in uh, in Washington D.C. Um, and the Europe uh, European part was then in uh, Germany Rhein-Main Air Base, and basically to monitor the uh, CFE, the Conventional Forces Europe Arms Control Treaty, the INF, in Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty. Uh, so we were specifically recruited for the new treaty, which was the CFE, for uh, reducing the number of uh, tanks, artillery units, or artillery pieces, uh, armored fighting vehicles, mortars, and all that kind of equipment uh, between the former Warsaw Pact and NATO. Understood. Understood. So we were conducting then flying out, prepping, flying out with our team uh, to uh, a disclosed inspection site units in, in the Soviet Union or, uh, yeah, former Soviet Union, uh, which was falling apart then as well. Uh, so every everywhere I went, they, they started falling apart. I don't know. Maybe it was me. <laughs> I, I have no idea. But uh, so that's where I, I did then three years of arms control treaty before moving on to be an instructor at the uh, International Long Range Reconnaissance Patrol School, the Special Forces uh, uh, Training Center in, in, in Southern Germany, along with also uh, the SAS and, and some other uh, UK folks. It was an international training center for Special Forces. And that's where I retired. I retired then from, from that school where I was a senior instructor for the US uh, in uh, 01 March 2001. Well, what would you say is the most surprising thing you experienced or saw whilst serving with USMLM? I mean, like I said, I, I said earlier, this, every every mission was was completely different. Uh, some sometimes was very boring, uh, and sometimes it was just uh, adrenaline pumping from from one moment to the next. I think it was always these these small. These small things that that stay, uh, you know, in, in your memory, like I, I mentioned earlier, with some of these these uh, incidents or stories. And I remember one time we pulled into to a, a training area, and again, uh, window down and listening, looking, and I hear somebody whistling, and 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 I'm thinking, who's whistling? I don't see anybody. And the officer's looking, and he says, "What is?" It? I said, "I hear somebody whistling." So you're sure? Yes. And all of a sudden, the Soviet guard falls out of the tree on top of my G-Wagon, so the hood or the bonnet. for, <laughs> And um, so you can imagine the look on my face as my buttocks are pulling the springs out of the seat of the G-Wagon. And I turn the engine on and I put in reverse and I start going back. And he rolls off the vehicle. He stands up and he's laughing his butt off. And I'm screaming like like a little, you know, frightened kid as I back out of there. So those are the kind of things that, you know, just st stay in, in your memory. And you think, oh, boy, did we have some fun in those days. Those are great stories. Have you got any souvenirs that you've kept? Yes, of course. Everybody, everybody, uh, we all took souvenirs. I think uh, probably when you had some of the other talks with uh, with the UK folks, mm -hmm. You know, the East German, or well, the Soviets back then put up what, what were called mission signs, mission restriction signs. They had no validity. They were not included in any, any agreement, but they just put them up. They were all four languages uh, to saying that uh, uh, passage of mission personal is prohibited. Uh, and so we had a sort of a, uh, you know, a thing that we always took them down and, and, and took them with us, uh, which really upset the East Germans and the Soviets. <laughs> but... <laughs> So you know, people make coffee tables from them and people, you know, I have one in my, in my, uh, in my little uh, museum room as well. But yeah, I mean, we, we always, you know, collected uh, with, with Soviet troops, uh, we exchange uh, uniform parts and watches and, and hats and, and things like that. And I have a piece of the Berlin Wall, I have a piece of the fence from the inner German border. So I have all that, that, that's memorabilia from, from the Cold War in East Germany. 
uh, in my in my little museum downstairs. If if you only had to keep one item, what would you choose? Uh, I would definitely keep the mission sign. Right. Yeah. 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 No, I've seen a few of those. That seems to be probably the most popular uh, souvenir. That and the license plate. License plate. Obviously, I have license plate, uh, but th- those were given to us obviously uh, when we left. Uh, and I, I happened to get the number 29, which was just just uh, uh, one of the ones that I toured mostly with uh, the plates. So I had uh, I was given number 29. But I think one of the things that that also I think is important to remember and we don't forget is uh, the fact that Major Nicholson was was killed in the line of duty. Uh, and not only Major Nicholson, but also Adjutant Chef Mariotti a year before uh, Major Nicholson almost to the day. Uh, and that's why um, I conduct a yearly ceremony uh, at the site, the memorial site in East Germany uh, or in, in Germany. So we're now in, in uh, Mecklenburg-Vorpommern, where in, near Teschentin, Ludwigslust, where Major Nicholson was killed, uh, the site of the former uh, tank range, the subcaliber tank range. And there's a memorial uh, stone that was erected um, years back. I think it was 2004, it was erected, 2005, can't remember. Uh, and so I didn't want it to be forgotten. You know, you, you, you dedicate this, this size, uh, stone and have this, this big ceremony and then that's it. No. I uh, said, so we need to make sure that it's done on a regular basis. So we try to do it every year uh, near the day, uh, the date of his, of his killing uh, in March, uh, 24 March. Uh, obviously, this year and last year, we could not do it because of the pandemic. Uh, so we are hoping that maybe to, to do it in the fall if everything works out. Uh, but we do that uh, every year at the memorial site. And we, and we remember not only Major Nicholson, but also Adjutant Chef Mariotti. And uh, we have uh, several veterans that come from uh, the UK, from Brixmas, from FMLM, from the Germans. The Germans actually support and run it. So the Bundeswehr uh, of the area. Uh, support all the logistics and, and the, to conduct the ceremony. Uh, and I think that's very important that we don't, uh, you know, he doesn't, he's not forgotten. Uh, these men are not forgotten. I think you're, you're absolutely right. And, you know, I really appreciate, you know, your, your service and the, and the service of, of those other members of the military liaison missions. The more that I study this period and learn about these missions they were obviously a very key part in keeping tensions uh low between the the soviet union and and nato and i think with the east germans and the soviets knowing that those missions were in east germany meant that they were going to find it really difficult to launch any form of surprise attack on nato and that's why they wanted to keep the missions alive, because over the years, there were, uh, you know, the East German government uh, were, were very keen at getting rid of us because they saw us as a, a, a thorn in their sovereignty. Uh, but the Soviets knew the importance because they were obviously in West Germany. So they wanted to keep the missions uh, alive and going at all costs, even after the Nicholson incident. Uh, in fact, um, that was very, very important to keep it, to keep it going. Do check out the episode notes at coldwarconversations.com slash episode 185. There's some really good photos of Tom in East Germany there, so do have a look at those. Now, you wouldn't be listening to this podcast without the generous support of our patrons. However, I want to especially thank our Politburo level members who are contributing a generous 30 US dollars a month to keep us on the air. They are Tony Sowards, Sam Hardwick, Nicholas Butter, Jeffrey Jones, Matthew Comstock, Mark Labance, Frederick Esposito, Darren Hughes, Jim Black, Ryan Vlaming, Stephen Kavalic, and Peter Ryan. Don't forget, if you like one of those Cold War Conversations coasters and help support the show, then head over to coldwarconversations.com slash donate. If you can't wait for the next episode, please visit our Facebook discussion group where listeners just like you continue the Cold War Conversation. Just search for Cold War Conversations in Facebook. Thank you very much for listening. It is really appreciated. Goodbye. Goodbye.